The following program is a paid presentation. Wake up to the Word. Share an uplifting hour with grace and glory and Baltimore's faithful. Well, good morning and welcome once again to Baltimore's number one gospel program, Grace and Glory. We're so happy to kick off the month of November with you this Sunday morning, and also equally so because we've got a familiar name and face with us, uh, Dr. Jermaine Johnson of Word of Life, uh, joining us, who's also part of the spoken word lineup here on Grace and Glory. Doc, how are you today? Doing well, doing well. Good morning, good morning. All right, well, it's a great getting up day. And uh, of course, uh, you've been with us for some time and I understand you've got an anniversary coming up. Yes, sir. We're celebrating 10 years, a decade of divine direction. And we are excited to celebrate with the Grace and Glory family. Man, I can remember you coming on Grace and Glory to announce the launch of that ministry. At the same time, there was a book, at the, I believe, that you had that you were releasing, correct? You got it, Pastor Lee, the New Wine Experience. We were able to launch that. And uh, we were able to uh, launch out into the deep and, and let down our nets for a catch with the World Life Church. And for 10 years, God has shown us tremendous favor. And we are excited and humbled of all that God has done in the ministry. Well, listen, we're excited to have you with us. And also want you to have an opportunity to share a little bit of the back line of the journey, okay, uh, when we come back. Yes, Let's make our way to our first spoken word. Uh, Bishop Dante Hickman is joining us over at uh, Southern Baptist Church. And then we'll be back with Dr. Jermaine Johnson right here on Grace and Glory. Welcome to the television broadcast ministry of Southern Baptist Church. And now a word from our pastor, Dr. Dante L. Hickman, Sr., my dear brothers and sisters, by the time of our text, Jesus is moving closer to fulfilling his ultimate assignment of sacrificing his life on the cross of Calvary for our sins. And with every episodic or passing chapter towards the cross, the more intense the opposition, intimidation, and rejection became against Jesus. When he was born, you might note, that there was enormous fanfare, celebration, and affirmation of who he was and what he had come to do. Throughout his ministry walk in the world, people from all walks of life worshiped him for his miracles and for his messages. But as he was getting closer to actually fulfilling the plan of salvation, the enemy intensified his attack politically, religiously, socially, spiritually, and emotionally. Subsequently, in this particular text, Jesus continued to address the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes who had the nerve to question his authority on cleansing the temple from the money changers. Just in the previous chapter, Jesus had to come into the tabernacle and turn over tables because they were selling blemished animals to people to sacrifice for their sins, imperfect animals, bruised sacrifices, and to make matters worse, they were charging people high rates of interest on the currency that they had to exchange to buy these particular sacrifices. Jesus <clears throat> turned over the tables and said, My father's house shall be called a house of prayer, but you instead have made it a den of thieves. And then he put them all out so that there was nobody but Jesus left in the house. These religious leaders had always been jealous of the multitudes of people that Jesus attracted. They were mesmerized by his miracles and they were dumbfounded by his messages. But my brothers and sisters, they became irate when Jesus started messing with their money. It was one thing for him to draw the crowds. It was one thing for him to perform all the miracles and to teach sermons by the sea or in the mountains or in their synagogue. But it was another thing when Jesus messed with their money. When they started losing money, they said it's time for this brother to go. And they really may come true what the book of Proverbs meant in Proverbs 21 and 20, that a fool and his money are soon parted. And when you think about that word of wisdom, it is very accurate because you have to be a fool to choose money over the master, to choose money over the miracle worker, to choose money over the healer of every disease, to choose money over the mountain mover, the creator of the universe and the savior of the world. How is it 
that you would choose the resource over the source of the resource. But that's exactly what these religious leaders did. So Jesus, in the wake of what they were doing, tells this parable in chapter 12 to expose their rejection. In essence, this is what he says in the parable, that a master of a vineyard provided a productive vineyard to some vine dressers. But when the master sent various servants to receive some of the harvest of the vineyard, the vine dressers would beat them, mistreat them, and ultimately kill the master's son, all with the erroneous hopes of taking the vineyard from the master that provided it to them in the first place. Here God had been good to them, but they decided that they didn't want God to be in charge of them, and they wanted what God gave them for themselves, so they sought to take it from God. Jesus in this parable really demonstrates that some people have the nerve, the nature, and the nastiness to reject you despite the sacrifices that you made for them. Don't look now, but everybody won't appreciate you for what you've done in their lives. Some people will take your help and then spit in your hand. Some children will be fed by you, clothed by you, and still grow up to tell you that you never did anything for them. There'll be people in your life that act like you never existed and like your help to pay their bills, your help to help them get through the hardest time in their lives really did not matter. It's not the people that don't like you and never liked you that hurt you. It's the ones that uh, you thought loved you and that you helped that turn around and stab you in your back. But Jesus, my dear brothers and sisters, did not wear his heart on his sleeve. He did not internalize their rejection. Instead, he exposed their issues to them through the word that really reflected what God had been doing since the Old Testament to reconcile the world back to himself. Even from Genesis, this parable plays out. This parable really tells the story from the beginning to the end, how God gave Adam and Eve a vineyard or a garden, and then God wanted some fruit, and the fruit that he wanted was obedience, but they didn't want to give him the fruit of obedience. They disobeyed him, and then God had to put them out of the garden but in his grace and his mercy still strives to give us a way back into the garden that we could just follow Noah and get on the ark of salvation and we can just follow Moses and get through the wilderness after 40 years and we can follow Joshua and get into the promised land and we can follow Rahab and have faith against all odds and we can follow Deborah and a woman who has power even in war and wisdom a judge if we can just follow david he had sins but at least he was a man after god's own heart but one after the other the bible says that these people rejected every servant that god sent who was just trying to get some fruit back to god but Jesus said, you know what? I'm not even going to cry about it because I understand their rejection is not personal. Some people will reject you just because they're unaccountable. Let the church say unaccountable. Here it is that all the master wanted was a little bit of the fruit of the vineyard when, when harvest time came. But each time he sent somebody to collect a little bit of the fruit, the Bible says that these particular people would take them, beat them, and send them away empty-handed. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, they forgot that the master didn't give them a vineyard that needed foundational work. The, ma the master didn't give them a fixer-upper. The master gave them a vineyard that was already productive. It was already planted, already built, and already working in their favor. Uh, he had given them something that they could be productive with and prosperous from. And my dear brothers and sisters, you you ought not take that long to give God praise when you think about what he's done in your life. When you consider what God has given to you, you have to admit that a little fruit in return is worth all the favor that he has bestowed on your life. I mean, think about it, my brothers and sisters. How insensitive and unaccountable can we be? When we think of a God who doesn't ask for 90%, he only asks for 10%. 
When we think of a God that doesn't ask for seven days, he only asks for one day in a week. And that one day isn't even all day. I mean, God only requires a little of us, and all we ought to do is be glad enough to give God thanks and to give God praise for what he has done. But I'm afraid we are living in an unaccountable generation, a generation that has a sense of entitlement. And if you don't teach your children and your grandchildren how to pay bills, then they will think that the mail that comes, they can toss it aside, not pay their property tax, not pay their water bill, and your house that you worked so hard for will end up like a house on Chester Street because you didn't teach your kids how to be accountable. The Bible says that they rejected uh, the servants that God or the master sent because they were unaccountable and they were unreasonable. Let the church say unreasonable. The, the Bible says that Jesus said they didn't just reject one servant, but every servant that the master sent. They would beat, they would mistreat, they would kill, and, and they, would, uh, they would shame. Now, I thought that maybe it was the first servant. Maybe the first servant was a little ruthless like Joseph in the Old Testament who taunted his brothers with a coat of many colors, and then he bragged about he was going to be in charge of everybody, and they just got sick of him and just wanted somebody else to lead them. But no, Jesus said everybody that the master sent that these vine dressers would beat them, mistreat them, and then ultimately kill them. Can I park here and parenthetically and tell you that something is wrong with you when you can't work with nobody? I, I mean, everybody that God sends you, you can't work with them. Every job you go to is always something wrong with the boss. You always got haters in your circle of friends. Child, everybody ain't hating on you. Everybody doesn't like you. Everybody doesn't even know you. And you up there on your social media feed talking down to everybody. And you ain't got but one like on your page. And that came from you. Ain't nobody thinking about you. And I've come to realize, my dear brothers and sisters, that some people can't deal with nobody because they can't even deal with themselves. And what really makes you powerful is not how you beat people, but it's how you treat people. People. It is how you treat the least of these. It's how you love folk that can't even stand you. It does not mean that you got to be with them. It doesn't mean that you got to live with them. It doesn't even mean you got to support them. It just means don't harbor no hate in your heart. Move on about your business and don't give them another opportunity to do anything else to hurt you. Have I got a witness here? Here it is, my dear brothers and sisters. Watch how you handle the people that God is sending to you to get what you owe him. Yeah, if God sends you somebody that's telling you you ought to praise him, then don't you think you ought to give God praise whether somebody tells you to or not? I mean, when you consider what's going on in our world and the diseases that are moving across the land and yet you're still walking and talking, you're still surviving and living. I mean, I know you lost an hour of sleep, but you ought to thank God that you didn't lose a hour of life and you still got health and strength you ought to give God the praise that God deserves Bible says Jesus he didn't take it personally because he knew that some people are unaccountable that some people are unreasonable and then some people are just ungrateful let the church say ungrateful he says I tell you what I know some of the people I sent were imperfect I sent Noah and Noah was a drunk and y'all didn't want to trust him I sent Moses and Moses was a madman and let people get on his nerves and he got so mad that he missed the promised land. But let me park parenthetically and tell you don't let people make you so mad that you miss your blessing messing around with their foolishness. 
preached Dante. He, he says maybe they would not follow Rahab because she was a prostitute. Maybe they wouldn't follow Deborah because she was a woman. Maybe they wouldn't follow David uh, because he was an adulterer, a fornicator, a murderer, a liar. He was all kind of stuff. So I'll send my son. He ain't done nothing to hurt nobody. In fact, when I sent them down there, he was healing the sick and raising the dead and unstopping deaf ears and giving sight to the blind and delivering people from devils. He was down there feeding the hungry and comforting the lonely. My son was down there forgiving the unforgivable and loving the unlovable. Maybe they'll love my son, but don't you know they said, here comes his son. You tell you know what we're going to do with his son? We're going to hang him high. We're going to stretch him wide. We're going to kill him because once we kill him, then we can own uh, this vineyard and we won't owe the master anything else. Can you imagine that they killed the son of the one who blessed them? They killed the son of the one who helped them. They killed the son of the one who prospered them. And don't look now if they'll do that to Jesus. What do you think people on your job will do to you? What do you think people in your house will do to you? What do you think people in this wicked world will do to you? And all God requires is just a little bit of gratefulness. Some of us come to church and we never tell God thank you. We never praise. We, we never thank. We never give. We never serve. We never bless. We never pray. We never study. We never learn. But I stop by to tell you that you can't be great without being grateful sometime. And I need all the grateful folk to just jump up right quick and shout I'm grateful. I'm grateful for what God has been doing in my life. I'm grateful for the stuff God has protected me from. I'm grateful for what God has provided in my life. I'm grateful that God keeps looking beyond my faults and meeting me at my point of need. I'm grateful that I don't deserve to be here but God gave me one more chance and with this chance that I get I'm going to praise him. They tell me there's a virus going around that will cause shortness of breath but I stop by to tell you that as long as I got breath I'll pra praise the Lord praise you thank you Jesus you've been good to me glory to you every time I turn around you keep on doing great things for me until I breathe my last I will give his name praise Jesus Jesus didn't internalize their rejection. Instead, he externalized it. Somebody shout, you got to get it out. See, that's what the devil is trying to do to us. He's trying to discourage us and dissuade us. He's trying to send people at us that will stab us in our backs and mess with our minds. But you got to guard your heart. You got to guard your mind. You got to guard your emotions because the devil knows that the only way he can kill you is you've got to self-destruct so you've got to he's got to get in your head and he's got to get in your heart but somebody shout you gotta get it out you gotta get it out that's why you come to church on Sunday because you gotta get it out you gotta get it out that's why you need a mental health therapist to talk to because you gotta get it out you gotta get it out if you internalize it and you try to rationalize it and you try to emotionalize it and if you try to spiritualize it, it can dominate your mental capacity but sometimes you got to get it outside of you so that somebody can help you to know it's nonsense and you can't make sense out of nonsense have I got a witness here so Jesus says I tell you what I'm going to do I'm on my way to that old rugged cross and everything in me wants to quit everything in me wants to give up when I look at the people I'm dying for it seems like it's not worth it. I've got to deal with this denying Peter. I've got to deal with a doubting Thomas. I've got to deal with a betraying Judas. And the rest of the disciples are quiet and ain't got nothing to say. He said, Dante, you think you got a tough church? Look at the church that I had to deal with. But I'm so glad to report that when Jesus came to the end of his journey, he was not 
giving up no quitting. He said the same word that brought me will be the same word that will keep me. He preached the word that exposed the rejection of the enemy. But I came to tell you his word is like a double-edged sword. It cuts one way, but it cures another way. I'm trying to get out y'all way to, so y'all can have a good day. But I'm trying to tell you that God gave a word that exposed their rejection, but it encouraged him to endure his season of rejection. I'm trying to preach to somebody in this house that it's impossible to go through life without being rejected by somebody. I don't care how cute you think you are. I don't care how much money you have I don't care what you drive and where you live I don't care how much education you got I don't care how black you become or how white you become there'll be always somebody that will try to reject you and say that you're not good enough if you're broke you're too broke and if you listen to some of these democratic candidates if you got too much money you're a bad person as well I wish I had a witness up in here. I made up my mind. I don't let, I'm not going to allow anybody to pull me apart. And in every direction, I'm 48 years old. And if God loves me, it's time for me to love myself. Wrap your arms around yourself and just say, I love myself. That does not mean that people will not hate you. But I stopped by to tell you that God won't let the rejection of the wicked folk in your life go unpunished that's why Jesus asked the question he said what will the owner of the vineyard do I wish I had a preaching church I just need a hundred of y'all to ask what will the owner of the vineyard do he's watched you struggle he's watched you suffer he's watched you so in tears he's watched you come to church Sunday after Sunday and Wednesday after Wednesday. He watched you give your tithes and pay your offerings. He's watched you sing on the choir. He's watched you preach in the pulpit. He's watched you serve in the pew. He's watched you be faithful over a few things. And yet it seems like the devils in your life keep on winning. They keep holding you down and they keep holding you back need somebody to ask what will the owner of the vineyard do when you're trying to love people but they can't stand you when you pray for people and all they do is laugh at you what will the owner of the vineyard do you preach in season and you preach out of season you preach till you're blue and black in the face and people still act like they don't understand they don't grow to another level of commitment. They stay where they've always been stuck. What will the owner of the vineyard do? I'm glad y'all ask. If you hang in there, if you endure a season of rejection, God will cause a redirection of his favor in your life. Somebody ought to shout. I feel God moving in my direction. Can I preach? Please let me preach. I feel like shouting. I'm right in the Bible. I'm going to shout myself crazy. When I read this next verse, Jesus answered his own question. He said he will come and he will destroy the vine dressers and he'll give the vineyard to somebody else. Y'all still ain't shouting. I'm going to shout with those of y'all that will shout with me. I want you to repeat after me. He will come. He will destroy and he will give. That's all I want to preach. I want you to just talk to yourself and say when I endure my season of rejection, he will come. He will destroy and he'll give the vineyard back to me. First thing I'm going to shout on to him is he going to come. That means he ain't going to leave me by myself. He's been sitting high. He's
he's been looking low. He's been seeing the hell that I've been going through. He said, but hang in there. I'm on my way to where you are. And when I get there, you ain't got to raise a finger. When I get there, you ain't got to cuss nobody out. When I get there, you ain't got to point nobody out. I'm going to destroy everybody that tried to destroy you. And I'm going to give you what they took from you. Because people who don't like you can't keep the stuff that belongs to you. Can I preach? like I feel it. I ain't gonna tell you talk to your neighbor. I'm just gonna tell you shout hallelujah. Come on, shout hallelujah. And whatever God has for you is coming back to you better than when the devil had it. Shout hallelujah. He's gonna give you houses that you did not build. He's gonna give you vineyards that you did not plant. He's gonna give you clothes that you did not make. He's gonna give you money that you did not earn. If you receive it and believe it, shout hallelujah. Can I preach? Please let me preach. God will cause a redirection of your favor and God will cause a resurrection of everything that failed in your life. I need somebody to jump up and shout my resurrection is coming any day now. Let me hang it on the word of God. Jesus said, have you ever read the scripture that the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? Y'all ain't helping me preach. I'm trying to tell you that when you belong to God, you ain't ever got to worry about who misplaces you. Somebody shout, you can misplace me, but God will replace me. God will put me back where I belong. I need 30 of y'all to holler. I'm the chief. Yeah. I may not have the position, but doggone it, I got the power. I may not have the assignment, but doggone it, I got the anointing. Somebody holler. I'm the chief. I'm the head. I'm the limber. I am up above and not beneath. Yes, we about to shut it down up in here. I feel like shutting it down. If y'all gonna help me, shut it down. Just holler, shut it down. Dante, shut it down. Somebody ought to shout. They killed the son. They forgot something. They killed the servants. They forgot something. They killed Noah. They killed Joseph. They killed Moses. They killed David. They killed Deborah. They killed Rahab. They killed Ruth. They killed Naomi. They killed Ezekiel. They killed Isaiah. They killed Jeremiah. They killed Obadiah. They killed Nahum. They killed Malachi. They killed Matthew. They killed Mark. They killed Luke. They killed John. They killed Peter. They killed Paul. They killed Jesus. But they forgot. They forgot. survive. I will survive. I will thrive. I will succeed. Yes! 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 Won't God keep you alive? Yes! Let them hate you. Let them reject you. Let them put you down. God will pick you up. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? You've been watching the television broadcast of Southern Baptist Church, where Dr. Dante L. Hickman Sr. is the pastor. If you desire to purchase a copy of this week's broadcast or any of our other media treasures, please call our media ministry at 410-732-8566.
Thank you, Bishop Hickman. And as we mentioned, Dr. Jermaine Johnson is with us, Senior Pastor of Word of Life, uh, joining us today to talk about this anniversary celebration that's coming up in a few short weeks, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Next week, the, the, the entire month of November, we are celebrating 10 years of ministry. But on next Friday, on, the, on November the 12th, we'll be having a gala at the Martins West facility celebrating 10 years. And we are wow. so grateful for that. There's still time for you to join. All right. Listen, we're going to get some more information about that so that the Saints can join in on the celebration. But uh, I, my personal question to you is, what has been what has the 10 year journey been like? Um, an incredible ride with God, an incredible ride, a ride of uh, elevation, a ride of humility, uh, starting a church from the ground up. Yeah. The unfinished basement of my home, uh, being a broken individual at the time and, and just watch God restore me and build me up in ministry. So it's been a wonderful ride to be able to serve the people of God. Uh, to see people give their life to Christ, give baptized, to serve in ministry, to become leaders, to accept their call. It's been an incredible ride. You know, uh, just a few short weeks ago, we had a guest, uh, Pastor uh, Apostle Ledbetter, and she made reference to our personal healing. Uh, and, and now here I hear you say, even in the midst of your call, there was the recognition of some personal healing. Um, Many times people don't realize that with the man or woman of God who accepts the call, there may also have to be some personal healing that has to take place. What was that experience like for you? Well, I, I, I liken the personal healing to uh, Jesus's ministry, his personal work. The Bible tells us in, in Matthew 3 that when Jesus is baptized by his cousin John the Baptist, the father has a voice. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. But mm -hmm. chapter 4 tells us the spirit leads him right into the wilderness to be tempted. So right. I think wilderness and, and brokenness is a prerequisite uh, to the assignment that's forthcoming. And I'm so grateful for my prior seasons that have prepared me to serve the people of God because through my serving, I found healing. I found Isaiah 58 healing taking place. As you serve others, you yourself were healed. So I'm so that's grateful. That's good. That's good. That's personal growth, too. So uh, Vision 3300, what exactly is that? I saw that in one of your uh, advertisements. What What is that all about? Vision 3300. So in the eighth year of Word of Life ministry, we were leasing properties and we uh, renovated very uh, a couple of properties. But Vision 3300 was an opportunity for us to purchase property at 3300 Glen Avenue. Okay. We rallied the troop up. We rallied the remnant. We had we had a Joshua, we're gonna claim this mountain type experience. And the people uh -huh. came together, Nehemiah style, with their resources and prayers and faith. When I say resources, with their money. And we uh -huh. came together and we purchased 3300 Glen Avenue, uh, right in the northwest area of Baltimore. Congratulations. And that's Vision 3300, y'all. And we renovated the property, and here we are in it. Now, now here is the irony. You're telling me that uh, your church, in the midst of a almost two-year pandemic, was not only able to sustain itself, but able to expand by acquiring a property in the midst of all of this that's going on, a pandemic. Yes, Vision 3300 is the two fish, five loaves miracle. January, two months before the pandemic, we, were, we purchased the property. And then wow. once the pandemic happened, I'm like, Lord, what are we going to do? I have a lease payment. Now I have a mortgage. And then I need an additional $500,000 to renovate a property. Wow. What did you know, I took two fish, five loaves of bread, lifted up to heaven. Won't he do it? <laughs> Won't he do it? <laughs> Won't he do it? So that, that's awesome. I'm sure the people of God are encouraged uh, by what has transpired. And uh, what has been, the, well, first off, uh, because I've watched your broadcast here on Grace and Glory, um, I, I see that you're back into your uh, a sanctuary. How has that transition been for you? And I know while while the pandemic had everybody on lockdown, you were you you were modifying your broadcast like many, uh, taking advantage of uh, uh, technology and the digital platform to to do the. What was that like for you? Well, um, for for a year plus, we're preaching to uh, five or six people, the production crew and the the praise team, and in this building, we we were here just taping. But our actual first worship experience was actually the second Sunday in October. So just under a month. So you just recently went in. Just recently. 
before wow. we were filming from the building, but we did not have the congregation here. Okay. Uh, so it was a wonderful experience to be able to preach to people and have a congregation, uh, but we found it to be faithful. I'm sure it matured us. It made us all appreciate uh, coming together as a community of faith. This, this period, this season, uh, really purged the ranks of those uh, who weren't really into it because they had a heart for ministry, but they were expecting other things. And, 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 but, but there is also a glorious opportunity that has been presented to the church because we are in a season now where people are looking for answers because their norm has been disrupted, their, their, their comfort zone has been unsettled, and they're looking for answers moving forward. And the church has the opportunity to step forward with a very clear voice to speak into their lives. Without question, without question. I think it also uh, gave people an opportunity to reflect, to uh, reignite, to recenter themselves for some rest, because some of us just were running, just being busy. Uh, so a, a lot of <laughs> yeah, that's that, that was, I put my hand up because uh, you know one of the things our old preacher told me said understand there's a difference between being busy and being productive. There you go, there you go. Yep, the devil is busy. Yeah, when you put your hand up, I'm looking like uh, who, who, who raised their hand? <laughs> 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 you were saying amen as a witness. <laughs> Listen, when we come back, I want you to be able to share with everyone how they can also join in and share in this celebration that's coming up uh, in just a few short days, as well as how they can connect and follow and uh, support your ministry, okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Let's make our way now to uh, Pastor Jason Clark, Omega Baptist Church, right here on Grace and Glory. Thank you for tuning in to the broadcast ministries of Omega Baptist Church. We're so glad that you joined us here on Grace and Glory, and we hope that you have your Bibles open, you're in prayer, and you're ready for praise and preaching. The Word of God is coming to you right now. Be blessed. Not going to be here, but we're praying for you, amen, and your family to the glory of God. God is good. Now we're going to get into the Word of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, bless this message and use this messenger. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. God, I just want them to hear you. They may see me, but let them hear you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Let every heart say amen. Come on, put your hands together one time for the Lord. Now, because it's Halloween, right? or well, that day people celebrate, we call it Harvest Fest. I want you to understand how important it is for me to dress up like a steel, right? Who, for the Ravens, is like literally our arch enemy. They're the people that always give us the blues. Their defense versus our defense, right? Their quarterback versus our quarterback. Well, we watched it, right? And we're not an old franchise, but we watched it happen. We watched Ben Roethlisberger go get Flacco. And both of them get, what, a Super Bowl? And, and, and we watch over and over and over again these issues between this Pittsburgh and this Baltimore. And so when I thought about writing all these sermons for fourth and, fourth and goal, I thought to myself, you know what, guys? In order for us to really depict this, we're going to go through all of these lessons in a way that's going to bless you. So let's go. Your enemy is a stealer. Let the church say amen. amen. I this whole month, and I got my props here because God is good, this month have preached about different, I've had you guys face, here it is, the lions, I've had you guys face, here it is, the eagles, I've had you guys face the chiefs, and last week I had you face the giants. All of those people, I have worn those uniforms. And the one thing, Sister Kathy, you have to think, well, Pastor, I thought you were a Ravens fan. But you all this, this week have had on, all this month, all these different uniforms. And, and the first thing I want to share with you guys is this, is that oftentimes we will wear the uniforms of the past wars that we fought against, the past issues that we had. And some of you haven't taken off the scars or the stars or the issues that you had in your past. You're still wearing what you 
went through. So we don't know what team you're on because you're still wearing the team uniform for the last thing that you battled. You're still battling that debt. You're still battling that divorce. You're still battling those issues, that pain, and that it, that uniform is still on you. And the first thing God said, Jason, before you tell them anything about their enemy being a steal, like, tell them they're going to have to take that uniform off. You're going to have to take off that pain of your past. You're going to have to take off that uniform with which you don't belong. Because if you're a Ravens fan, you need to put on your Ravens jersey. And if you're a Christian, you need to put on the bloodstained banner of the Lord, Jesus Christ. I'm going somewhere. I know Pete Bryan is sitting over there thinking, I never thought I would see my pastor in a ski mask. That just means Brother Ryan times is hard in this COVID pandemic for pastors. Trying to make ends meet boulders and make a ski mask. And I'm joking, I'm not a ski mask. But listen to what the Word of God says. John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. That's what the stealer does. The reason why he wears gloves is because he doesn't want to leave any fingerprints. He doesn't want you to know who did it. That's why he wears a mask. And many of you just look at me right now. Many of you say, I know that's pastor because I just watch him put the, the mask on. Right, right. But that's many times how your enemy does you. Uh -huh. Puts on uh, gloves so you don't know their fingerprints. Right. Puts on a mask so you don't see him coming. Uh -huh. And so when he comes in or she comes in to steal from you, you don't even know it's them. You don't know who the stealer is because they have a mask on. It might be somebody close to you. It might be somebody you love. It might be somebody who said they love you. And that's why you have to count on this, that Jesus said, I have come, that you might have life and have that life more abundantly. I'm going to overheat up here. Your enemy can be a stealer. Can I talk to you guys for real? I mean, sister and brother, your enemy. Come here, sister. Come Come, come here, come here, sister. Uh, Sister Debbie, come, come on, come on up, come on up, I want people to see you. They can even be, come on, stand next to me, members of your congregation. Some of the people that can steal your joy can be sitting next to you on the pew. They can be people that you love, that you care for. It can be people in your household. It might someday be your pastor. Your pastor stole your joy. You came to church to praise God, and he ain't let nobody sing. I was mad when I left. If they can be people you love. Y'all can take your seat. Y'all look okay. You never know who it's going to be. You never know who it's going to be. Because it can be a friend, a spouse, a parent, a family member, a co-worker, a child. It can be anybody. Can be a stealer in your life. What do you mean? Oh my God. It can even be my sister. I did this on purpose. Because I know she's watching. Lori, if you're out there, this one's for you. That I had a sister come back in my life. July 18th of this year. Looks kind of like me. God, she had the audacity. Not to be a Raiders fan. I could understand that she's from LA. But to be a Steelers fan? Oh my gosh. I mean, I'm proud of it. Her husband has a whole Steeler man cave upstairs in the house. That's told us we can come stay with them anytime we want. <laughs> Not staying in that haunted house. Right on, Lord. Amen. Your enemy can be anybody that the enemy uses. Right. But you have to remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Amen. We wrestle against powers and principalities and the spirit of darkness in high places. Yeah. So don't make it personal. Come on, help me here. You got to be more powerful than making it personal. Let me keep going. See, here's the thing I want you to understand. Satan is strategic. Yeah. He, he, no, see, see we, we've allowed him to get off the hook by not talking about him enough. I mean, we, we shouldn't talk about him more than we talk about our Savior, but we should let everybody know that the enemy is strategic. Let me get to the thought before I pass out of here. <laughs> see, what I want you guys to see is that Satan is so strategic that this week he tried to destroy everything in my life, including me. He had me so down that I had to reach for what, what I knew would work. I had to reach for the prayers of the saints. I had to ask my wife first, pray for me. I'm going through. I know I'm not in my right state. I had to call to California. I reached out to everybody who I knew could pray to pray because prayer is what you have. Yeah. It's what you need. Somebody say amen. amen. Satan is strategic because what he does is he divides the house of God. He makes me against you, and you against me. He divides us because he is, the devil is a divider. Say it the devil, the devil is a divider. That's what he does. 
he divided the house of God. Then he disconnects you from God. Once he gets you out of the house of God, he disconnects you. He doesn't, he doesn't say, you don't need to pray. You don't need to praise. You don't need to spend no time with God. Turn off that gospel music and put on that young thug. I know against the young thug, but the instance is this. He doesn't want you hearing the gospel. He doesn't want you hearing what's going to rejuvenate you. Can I keep preaching? He says, first we're divided, then we're disconnected, then we, he makes us disobedient to the word of God. He gets us to start disobeying God's word. Where God says, pray without ceasing, he says, don't pray at all. Where God says, give God the praise all the time and let your mouth be filled with it, he says, God don't deserve the praise you did. He gets you to start being disobedient to the word of God, and he got you right where he wants you. Because that's what the devil does. I'm about to turn the TV. Praise God. Let me show you. That's what he did to Adam and Eve. Many of your marriages are going through right now. And the reason why your marriage is going through is because the devil is divided. That's what he does. He gets you and her separated. And if we're not prayed up, we'll do stupid things like I've done in the past. You're like, no, I need to find somebody else. Right? Because you'll be thinking that it's flesh when really it's a spiritual battle. The enemy knows if he can separate you from praying with your wife and staying with your husband, that he can mess up your family. Y'all are not saying amen. So he's the divider. And so Adam and Eve got to stick together because if he gets one of you by yourself, he can whisper in your ear. You can eat that if you want. You can cheat if you want. You can go without with him if you want or her what you want. Y'all ain't listening in here. That's what he does. He does it because he is the divider and he's a yeah. scheme and that's what he does. He separates Adam from Eve. And then what does he do? He says, when they were disconnected from God, God wasn't with them. They weren't looking for God. They were looking at the tree. Uh -huh. And so here come God walking in the cool, right? And they hear God and they feel like they're naked so they got to go hide themselves. He right. says, they ate something they were forbidden from eating. Uh -huh. My God. You start doing forbidden things. Right. You start doing no things. And when you do something that's forbidden, the first thing you want to do is get hit. Boy, I want to talk in here to somebody. Ever, ever break something and you know when it broke, you was going to get in trouble? And you know they're going to know who did it. So what did you do? Hide. Jeremiah, you ever hide from mommy? Amen. I know that's what Jeremiah said. So, I got to talk to Zoe. Zoe, because she real with hers. You ever have to hide because you did something you was hoping one of the other kids took the blame for? That's right, so it's true in church. Because I'm telling the truth in church. I broke it, but I was hoping Ava got brain for it. I, was, I, was, I broke it, but I was hoping that Braylon got brain brain for it. Because when you do something forbidden, the best thing you, the thing we do as humans, we want to hide. But that's how the devil treats us. He wants us to think that God isn't that forgiving. Come on, help me in here. Watch God. So let's write, let's let's get the strategic strategy of the enemy. You got to know what your enemy is. You got to know how the enemy works. You got to know how the steel works when we talk. Sorry, Debbie. <laughs> Debbie's a lawyer, so she really took me to task on the steel idea. I said, I said, Debbie, it's a play on words. Whatever, Pastor. I said, but Debbie, you see the words are spelled different. There's the A and E, right? I'm really not. But yeah, okay. okay. Just want to throw shade. <laughs> Didn't she wear them, Brooks? She was texting that to us. So, so Tam says, he's a divider. Everybody say he's a divider. <laughs> Everybody say, he wants me disconnected. Everybody say, he wants me to be disobedient. And you have to make sure you don't give in to him. Because he wants you divided, he wants you disconnected, and he wants you to be disobedient. Let's go to the word of God. Because that's just the preliminary. I just wanted to show you what he does before I show you what he's stolen. Because he's stolen from each and every one of us. Praise be the name of God. He has stolen. Luke 11, 17 through 23. Here goes the word of God. Here it is. But he knowing that thoughts, Jesus knows what we're thinking. Uh -huh. And he knows what the enemy's thinking. He knows how the enemy thinks. So here's what he says. Every kingdom, here it is the word, divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against itself will soon fall. Uh -huh. So we have to stay unified and not divided. Uh -huh. God is a unifier. The devil is a divider. Uh -huh. So whenever you feel like division is taking place and separation is taking place, that's not of God. That's of the devil. He's not trying to get you and your husband on the same page. He's not trying to have you and your wife on the same page. He's not having you and your children on the same page. He's not trying to have the whole church on the same page. Because if he can get you to be against me and me to be against you, we will never win in, this, in the kingdom. Amen. A house divided will not stand. Somebody scream hallelujah. hallelujah. Because that's what the devil does. He divides, he disconnects, and he causes the children of God to be disobedient. That's his job. 
That's what he does. And he does it well because he's been doing it forever. Yes. Since we came on the scene, he's been doing it. And I don't care how smart you are, how sophisticated you are, he can even use you. Amen. Judas walked with Jesus and he used Judas. I don't care who your friends are. Your friends will give you bad advice when you're seeking, amen, salvation for your life. Amen. That's where you have to hear God for yourself. Can I keep preaching? Yeah. So then in this new chapter, he says, if Satan is also divided against himself, Jesus says, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Satan attacks Job. And here's what I want you to get. Watch this and look at this real quick. And I want you to raise your hand as soon as I call what you're going through. Satan attacks Job. Now, Job or Satan attacks is his job. But women call him Job because that's his name, okay? He's attacking your family. Raise your hand. He's attacking your finances. Raise your hand. He's attacking your flesh. Raise your hand. Come on, help me here. See, some of y'all should have both hands up and a foot. Because every area of your life is under attack. He's attacking your family. He's attacking your finances. And he's attacking your flesh. Because he knows those are the things that matter the most to you. Amen. Somebody say amen. God help you here. He knows that your family matters. He knows that your finances matter. He knows that you want to live and not die. Somebody say amen. So he attacks it. So Jesus said, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, who do your sons cast them out? Because the people that Jesus had called were casting out demons by the power of his name. He says, so they're going to judge you. But here's what I need you to understand. A lot of us don't understand we are already possessed. This hurt me. This hurt me bad. Because I didn't realize I was possessed by possessions. I didn't realize how much my lifestyle had a control over me. It wasn't life or death. It was lifestyle. Versus God's style. It was my will versus his will. It's what, what, what I want versus what God wants for me. And let me tell you something. Everything you've kept back from God is nothing compared to what God is keeping in store for you. The life you're living now is nothing compared to the life that God wants you to live. As good as you got it, the best vacation, the best car, the best schools, the best of what you think the best is, God said, that's nothing compared to what I have for you. Amen. Yeah, yeah, right. Because see, the devil has us so demon possessed by possessions that we won't give up what we have to get what God has for us. I'm, I'm walking in this. I mean, it, it hurt me. Because God sat me down right in front of him and said, this is what you're doing before the altar of the world. All right. You're looking at all your possessions, and you're so afraid to lose them. Once upon a time, you told the repossession man on about your truck, I'd rather, drive, I'd rather walk to heaven than drive to hell. But now your car means more to you than God does. Come on, help me here. Once upon a time, you had room in your closet to pray. But now, because you got so many tags hanging from stuff you don't even wear, you don't have nowhere to pray in your secret closet. Why aren't y'all talking to me? You, you, you get mad as you're, you're so The devil attacks what you love the most. And some of us love our lifestyles too much to ever be led by God. You'll be from the, you're, you're in front of the altar of Neiman Marcus and Saxon Avenue. Y'all aren't talking to me. And Home Goods. Y'all aren't talking to me here. You're in front of all those altars. And those altars are what are keeping you altered from being altered by God. And so you're altered under the anointing of the world. And so the world celebrates you. But the God is looking at you. And he's just pleased because you know it doesn't take flesh to please God. It doesn't take finance to please God. It takes faith to please God. And the reason why you're not getting pleased is because you're not doing anything by faith. And so God said, Jason, you're going to have to be willing to believe what's all all of that to get that demon out of you. Because many of us are possessed by our possessions. And do you know how fast that stuff can go? It can go while you're giving birth. It can go with a stroke at jump at work. It can go on a motorcycle accident. It can go on a car crash. 
It can go with an aneurysm. It, it, it can, you, you, you don't know what's going on. I'm trying to tell you. It can go on something you didn't plan on, but it happened. And everything you trusted in is now gone. Let me tell you. God can help you with demons. Demons can't help you with God. Y'all better get it in here. Satan attacks with what you love the most. What do you love the most? Do you love God the most? Uh, kind of right after my family. He said, okay, well, then I'm going to attack your family. Because that's going to be the area I use to get you away from God. Do, do you love God the most? Yeah, but right after my job, my career, and my money. Okay, that's what I'm going to attack to get you away from God. Do, do, you, do you love your flesh? Do you love your body the most? He said, that's what I'm going to attack to get you away from God. And as soon as I get you away from God, I'm going to deal with you the way that I really wanted to deal with you while you were with him. I'm going to treat you like a dog. I'm going to treat you just like I did Job. I'm going to try to destroy everything in your life. I'm going to get you to the place where you feel like giving up all hope and all things. He says, but Job had this kind of faith. Take my flesh. Y'all help me here. Take my finances. Here it goes. Take my family. I'm okay because I got this faith that says, though he slay me, I'm still going to trust him. That he can take my car, but because he's God, he can give me another one. He can take my family, but because he's God, he can give me more family. He can take my flesh, but because he's God, he can restore my body. How many of you here just under that impression that I'm now... Thank you for tuning in to our broadcast ministry of Omega Baptist Church and Ministries. Once again, I am Pastor Jason Clark. And if this ministry has blessed you, if the word has touched your life, I pray if you're led by the Spirit of God, to send in an offering, be a blessing to this ministry. If we blessed you with the word of God, I pray that you would share some of what God has blessed you with, with this ministry. Send a tithe, send an offering, send a seed offering, wherever you are led. And I'm asking God that he bless you some 30, some 60, some hundredfold return for everything that you give to this ministry. Thank you for tuning in and God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Clark. Thank you, Bishop Hickman. And thank you, Dr. Johnson, for being with us and encouraging us today. And we celebrate uh, uh, this milestone of ministry with you and also Vision 3300. And for those who would like to maybe visit your ministry, follow your ministry, or support your ministry, how can they do any or all of the above? Well, you can visit our website at www.wolccc.org. And we would love to have you um, this Friday, November the 12th, at Martin's West. My finance team or my trustees probably will be like, no, don't do this. But I would love for our Grace and Glory family to be a part of this. We can still make it happen. Uh, it's, it's going to be social distancing. There are well over 200 plus people that will be in attendance. And we are so excited. Martin's West from 7 p.m to 11 p.m. We're going to celebrate like it's 99, but it's 2021 of all that God has done. So then you can join us Saturday for our ribbon cutting service at 2 p.m. On November the 13th at 2 p.m., we will have a ribbon cutting celebration as we awesome. consecrate and celebrate this building. Welcome the community. Come in. Come on. Come on in. Come celebrate with us. And every Sunday you can meet us at 10 a.m. here in the sanctuary or Facebook or YouTube. We'll be right there. And don't be, don't forget now on Grace and Glory also. Grace on... and Glory next week. We there every second Sunday. We on Grace, Grace and Glory at 7.35. Either myself or co-pastor Michelle will be preaching the word of God. And we want to be able to share that word with you. And our Grace and Glory family has been a tremendous blessing. You've prayed for us. Some of you have blessed us financially. Thank you for that elevator. We got an elevator, y'all. An elevator <laughs> ministry. And you guys yes. us to, to help us get that done. It's here, it's working, it's operative, and we're grateful for that. All right, well, we're grateful for you and all that you continue to do, praying mightily for you, Michelle, and the entire Word of Life family, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Well, that does it for us for today. A good jump start to your Sunday. I pray that you'll enjoy the remainder of your day and come back and join us again next week. Until then, remember to walk in his grace and live in his glory. And we look forward to connecting with you next week right here on Grace and Glory. Hey, it's Ja'Kalen Carr here, and I want to congratulate Grace and Glory on their 20th anniversary celebration. You've been serving the community with the word, information, and entertainment for years. Also, Uncle Lee Michaels, thank you so much for all of the love and the support that you have shown towards my music and my ministry. Baltimore, you all are amazing. And here is to 20 more years filled with God's blessings upon you and grace and glory. Thank you.